Hello and welcome to the Spotlight. On the fifth day of the conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine, the delegations from both countries met for talks amid high hopes but low expectations for a diplomatic breakthrough. The representatives of both countries are now back in their capitals for consultations, while a UN General Assembly has also held an emergency session. In this edition of the Spotlight, we will discuss the recent developments and prospects for peace. But before that, let's get an update from our very own Jerome Hughes, live from Brussels. Jerome, tell us what's new. Yes, well, Gisu, you know, this is spelling out to so many different elements. You have the sporting world uh, responding to the crisis. You have a ban on Russian media outlets, which is another element to it. The aviation industry, all aircraft, all Russian aircraft cannot fly over the EU, land or take off. You have the SWIFT system, the, the, so the financial sanctions against Russia. A number of banks have been taken out of the SWIFT transaction system, which is quite damaging economically and also targeting there has been targeting of the uh, Russian Central Bank. Um, of course, then you have the, we're hearing about the so-called refugee crisis. Um, of course, if we were talking about people coming from other parts of the world, there would be migrants, but the refugees if they're coming from Ukraine. And of course, uh, terrible hardship for the people of Ukraine. It's not to underestimate that, but it's just the language that's being used by the EU is so different, which is interesting. And of course, a key thing here is you have the 500 uh, million euro, which was announced on Sunday yesterday by the European Union to finance the uh, military in Ukraine, which is a very serious development indeed. We heard today, Monday, that a lot of that will be spent on anti-tank weapons, but also there will be, you know, uh, fighter jets used, uh, sent to Ukraine as well. So it's quite a, a worrying development. But the, the, the big thing I wanted to mention as well is about tomorrow, because I think we're going to get a bit more nuance from the EU tomorrow, because uh, we have a, a full day in the European Parliament of debates on all of the issues that I've mentioned and others. I mean, I'm only uh, tapping into a few of the issues there, uh, but EU lawmakers will meet. They will vote on a number of the measures that have been taken or the proposals put forward by the European Commission and agreed by the EU leaders, they will vote on those proposals and we will hear debates on the issues that I've mentioned. So we're going to hear perhaps no doubt because there is a sizable number of lawmakers that will be critical of how the EU has responded to this from becoming a peace project perhaps to uh, a now a more military uh, block of 27 countries. So I think uh, tomorrow will be an interesting day Tuesday. And we'll be in touch with you for those updates. Thank you very much. That was our correspondent, uh, Jerome Hughes, live from Brussels. But to continue our discussion, uh, we are joined by former UN weapons inspector in Iraq and former U.S. Marine Intelligence Officer Scott Ritter. And also a journalist and activist and political analyst John Bosnick. Thank you very much to both of you gentlemen. Let's begin with Mr. Ritter. Now, why did diplomacy fail to prevent the war in Ukraine in the first place? And with the current stance of the EU and NATO, is there any hope that it ever will? Well, diplomacy was, there, there was no serious diplomacy. Diplomacy is a two-way street. Um, and people tend to say that you know, Russia is to blame because in December of last year, Russia put forward uh, very extreme uh, demands, uh, maximalist positions. And people said that, that that's no way to enter a uh, diplomatic uh, dialogue. But uh, pe people don't understand history. <laughs> that wasn't Russia's entree into diplomacy. That was Russia's final statement after 15 years of being ignored by the West. Um, you know, this isn't the first time we've heard about Russia's concerns when it comes to Ukraine and NATO membership. Uh, Vladimir Putin very famously warned about it in his Munich, uh, his speech before the Munich Security Council in 2007. And in 2008 or nine, following the uh, 2008 um, Budapest uh, Convention, where, or Bucharest, I think, um, where they invited, uh, NATO invited uh, Ukraine and Georgia to join. Uh, William Burns, who currently is the CIA director, but back then was the U.S. ambassador to Moscow, uh, wrote a memorandum where he outlined in great detail and accuracy Russia's concerns. And he said, we need to pay attention to this. Well, Burns was ignored. Putin was ignored. Russia was ignored. 
and diplomacy was never given a chance. NATO continued to expand. NATO continued to treat Ukraine as an ally and uh, as a proxy force. Uh, you know, Russia wasn't worried so much about Article 5 protections because Ukraine wasn't a member of NATO and didn't get didn't fall under the um, collective defense umbrella. They were worried about Article 4 because NATO, having designated Ukraine as an ally, could now create conditions in which NATO military power could be projected into Ukraine under Article 4. And it's not a joke. All of NATO's offensive military operations over history have been conducted in accordance with Article 4. The attack on uh, Belgrade in 1999, the intervention in Libya in 2011, the intervention in Afghanistan in 2001. These were all Article 4 operations, and Russia had every right to be concerned that the way things were going, even if NATO said, well, Ukraine will never be a member, Ukraine was a, a proxy member. So diplomacy was never given a chance. And frankly speaking, at this stage, I think the, the division between Ukraine's position, which is Russia has to leave, uh, leave all the abandoned troops, abandoned Crimea, in Russia's position, which is basically the Zelensky government has to denazify and, uh, and forever forswear NATO membership, uh, the distance is too far to be bridged at this point. Thank you very much. So uh, let's bring in our next guest here, Mr. John Bosnich. Uh, considering everything that was said, what are the prospects of uh, Russia getting what it wants, stopping NATO's eastward expansion? Well, this is a long-term struggle that uh, began almost exactly at the time that President Putin first came to office in Russia. So given the fact that Russia has resisted, first of all, has resisted the eastward push by NATO in every possible peaceful manner that anybody could have come up with until this point, we realize that finally what President Putin indicated to be the red line for the security and protection of the people of Russia had been crossed. He warned them at the time, and he has been perhaps the most patient leader in modern history. This time they've gone one bridge too far. Well, thank you very much. Now, back to Mr. Ritter. Uh, now, Scott, if you, I'm not sure if you were listening to Jerem Hughes, our correspondent, who gave us an update just before we started speaking. But he gave us a complete list of the sanctions imposed by the EU on Russia. The question is, how effective can these sanctions be? Well, we'll find out. I mean, the, you know, the important thing to note here is that these sanctions um, have been threatened for some time. And while the details weren't specified, um, you know, economic strategists in Moscow should have been able to predict uh, the range of options available to the West to sanction uh, Russia and come up with, um, you know, solutions to these problems before invading. Uh, I, I think everybody should have been able to foresee that uh, once Russia crossed the border into Ukraine, uh, the, the promised sanctions were going to be unleashed. Um, you know, now the proof is in the pudding. Is, is Russia, as many people have said, truly sanction proof? Or has the West finally found uh, the, the, the right mix of sanctions uh, capable of paralyzing the Russian economy to the point that it can actually compel um, you know, a change in policy on the part of uh, Vladimir Putin's government. Um, my betting, if I, were, if I were to bet, is that Russia has predicted these sanctions and has uh, solutions. Solutions will be painful, but um, the sanctions will not in and of themselves uh, cause any uh, deviation from the, 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 the direction that, that Russia is heading. So, Mr. Bosnich, do you agree? Because I saw that you were also nodding. Well, I, I can say from my own experience as a war reporter in the former Yugoslavia across all of the period from the beginning of the fighting until the final ending of fighting in, in Kosovo and so on, that uh, sanctions simply do not work. They generally tend to support the government that's in power, raise the public anger with the external forces that are sanctioning them and uh, generally fail. And uh, after sanctions, then there's attempted military regime change and so on. But sanctions are basically a ploy to convince the American public that they tried everything peaceful. 
before they get they, before they go to war. So sanctions are a kind of a a softener for the knockout punch, mean which is all always planned in advance, and that is the actual taking a military action abroad. That is the core engine of the U.S. economy. They're not turning it off. Well, thank you very much. Now, back to Scott. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky said in a recent tweet that his country has been left alone by the U.S. and the EU. Uh, why did they abandon Ukraine, or why uh, is Zelensky under the impression that he has been abandoned? Well, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the Ukrainian president um, in, in, in that the United States, NATO, Europe has been dangling the uh, promise of NATO membership before Ukraine. Um, and Ukraine, acting on this promise, has gone, in, gone all in in terms of doing uh, the, the bidding of the U.S. and NATO when it comes to Russia. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Zelensky and the Ukrainian uh, government um, didn't realize until too late that they had simply been a tool, a tool of provocation, um, that they were sacrificed by a, a Western power structure that needed Russia to do something dramatic, like militarily intervene in Ukraine so that there could be a final solution to the Russian problem. And that's, that's how the West sees this. The, you know, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has allowed uh, NATO to re, you know, become revitalized, has created a sense of unity in Europe, has joined the United States and uh, NATO and Europe together in a way that was uh, unimaginable back in August of last year when the debacle in Afghanistan was unfolding NATO was disgraced, America was embarrassed, and Europe was divided. Uh, now everybody is coming together, and they, they think they have a solution to the Russian problem through the vehicle of economic sanctions. I think they're all wrong, but that's, that's beside the point to your question. Uh, Zelensky was betrayed. Zelensky was led to believe that he would have the backing of the world, but the world only comes to his assistance now after the fact after his nation has been violated, after his people are being killed, um, and after his government uh, has been put on the chopping block. I, I don't think this ends with Zelensky still in power. Thank you very much. Now, back to Mr. Bosnich. Now, British author John Laughlin has said, and I'm quoting him, it is better to be an enemy of Americans than their friend. If you are their enemy, they might try to buy you. But if you are their friend, they will definitely sell you. Now, do you think that President Zelensky has realized this bitter truth? Well, I think I think he has. I strongly, I strongly agree with uh, my uh, colleague's comment. Uh, this is this is a, a general fact, but unfortunately, it's a fact learned usually by at least one betrayal. And so there is a there is a kind of, and it happened all across Eastern Europe. Um, there was a kind of euphoria of escape from communism and so on. And the the end upshot of the deal was that America actually selected the future governments of the new regimes in Eastern Europe, which are almost all hand picked and put in power by American campaign organizers and so on. So we've got a new kind of colony growing, and this is all the kind of thing that was taking place in Ukraine. And I do remember that we, we had one Georgian president who was a pro-American CIA supported president who was run out of Georgia and then he was appointed a governor in Ukraine. Well, it's standard policy for the CIA to rotate its agents from one field of operations to another. That was the most blatant sign that the CIA was calling all the shots in Ukraine. And remember this, when you talk about the comedian uh, president of Ukraine, Zelensky, a comedian is something before anything else, and that is a good actor. He probably knew there was no chance, but was given the orders to do what has happened, to see if Russia would respond or not. Now that Russia has responded, somebody in Washington is staying up late trying to figure out what to do. 
Thank you very much. Now, back to Scott. Let's uh, zoom out a bit and look at this from a world viewpoint. Uh, there's a lot of focus right now on the conflict in Ukraine. Everyone's talking about it. Any news channel you turn to was talking about Ukraine. But we never saw this uh, when the U.S. and NATO invaded Iraq and Afghanistan. Also now in Yemen, we really don't see that much news coming out from Yemen, whereas it has been uh, labeled a, a textbook example of a human humanitarian disaster by the United Nations itself. Why do you think it is so? Well, there's two there's two things at, at play here. One will just be right up front. It's blatant racism. Um, I, I don't mean to be offending to anybody who's watching this, but if your skin isn't lily white, your eyes aren't blue, your hair isn't uh, blonde, uh, we don't care about you. Not in the West. Um, we'll bomb you. We'll kill you. We'll we'll, we'll remove you from your homes. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll mourn you when it's politically necessary. For instance, if we want to put all the blame on the suffering of the people of Yemen on the shoulders of Iran, we'll cry for the people of Yemen. But it's, it's, it's crocodile tears. It's not real. Um, so th there's racism here. Two, um, the, the, the struggles that are taking place in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and elsewhere are ancillary to a larger geo geopolitical picture. They're, they're not game changers, meaning that no matter what happens in Yemen, the world will still be the same. What differentiates uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and, and other conflicts of this sort from Ukraine is that Ukraine is a game changer. I mean, this is a conflict being waged to change, fundamentally change, the European security framework and, by extension, to challenge the, the unilateral status held, you know, the power status held by the United States. The, so-called rules-based international order. Russia is challenging this with force. If Russia prevails, um, Europe will not look the same. And it's not just that Europe won't look the same, Asia won't look the same, the world won't look the same, because instead of a unilateral superpower called the United States, there will be multiple uh, polarities uh, of, of, of power. Um, it's it's a, a world-changing event. And this is why I think you see the West paying attention. They, they highlight the humanitarian aspect because, I mean, we've heard it over and over again at, at the train station in Poland. White people get on the train, dark people don't. So, you know, the humanitarian aspect is magnified because white people are, are play. But beyond, the, you know, the, that aspect of it, this is a global cha a game changer. If Russia prevails in what it's doing in Ukraine and successfully challenges NATO, uh, the NATO security structure that is governed in Europe, you know, since the end of the Cold War, um, you know, this will resonate. China will now feel emboldened vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan in the South China Sea, uh, and you might see other nations start to shake off uh, the, uh, the 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 mantle of post-colonialism. So, I think that's why uh, Ukraine is getting the attention because it's woken a lot of people in the West up about, oh my goodness, um, you know, the rules-based order <laughs> is being challenged and perhaps successfully challenged. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Bosnich, uh, if anything, for the rest of the world watching this, these recent developments have brought to light the issue of a bad war and a good war. Uh, not only can we see this in the coverage of the news, but also the international response to the conflict. We see countries rushing to help Ukraine. We never saw that uh, in other parts of the world. So could this at least trigger a more balanced approach now that we're talking about it, now that we're bringing it to light? Do you think that public opinion could change? It's going to be a, a far longer battle to change the brainwashed minds of many of the viewers of the lying mainstream media. I'm sorry to call it, but, but that's what it is in the West. I worked there for years and uh, I can tell you that it is exactly as it is. And every day for me was a battle there to try and get out a truthful article. Um, I can tell you that this is going to have a long-term resonance that will prove to the United States especially and to London, which usually trains the future leaders of the United States in their elite school system, it will prove to them that the day, the day, I don't say the days, this very short day of the Anglo-American empire is ending. And it's time to recognize that in the interest of survival, not just their own, but of everyone. 
They created this war driven by aggression. They have hundreds and hundreds of bases around the planet. They have started almost 80 wars since World War II, what they call military interventions. And now when Russia takes a similar act after years, seven and a half years of putting up with ethnically based genocidal attacks that Russia finally takes a very, very limited action in terms of deaths. We say several hundred are reported dead now instead of an invasion decide to destroy Ukraine. This will turn the tide. And it is a lesson for China. And it is a lesson also too for even India. These are lessons for the major powers and Iran as a power that has been threatened by the United States must take very careful, careful note of what's going on here. Well, thank you very much, Mr. John Bosnich, journalist and activist and political analyst out of Belgrade. And also Mr. Scott Ritter, former UN weapons inspector in Iraq and former US Marine intelligence officer out of Bethlehem, New York. Thank you very much to both of you gentlemen for sharing your thoughts with us. That's all the time that we have on this edition of The Spotlight. And thanks to all of you viewers for following this edition.